Good morning. Welcome to Miss Shantae's Storytime. Today we are going to read A Wing Ding Dilly by Bill Peet. Scamp flopped down heavily on the porch with a mournful sigh. <sighs> the old farm dog had been in a miserable mood for weeks and no one knew why. Not even his best friend, Orvi Jarvis, could guess what the trouble might be. Before dark mood, before the dark mood crept over him, Scamp had been a happy, carefree dog. He was always up early, racing out to the barn, a lot ahead of Orvi, eager for the boy to finish the morning chores, so the two of them could go rambling around the countryside just wasn't happy, was he? Now Scamp moped on the porch till Orvi called him. Then he came drooping along at the boy's heels, sad eyes and listless, not caring how long it took him to finish the chores. What's come over you, old Scamp? said Orvi one day. What makes you so sad? Scamp only replied in his dreary sigh. <sighs> there was no way of telling Orvi that he was tired of being a dog. He wanted to be a horse, not just any horse. Scamp wanted to be a great horse, like the Palomar, the giant Bercheridon who lived on the farm just across the road. Back in the days when there were lots of buggies and wagons, so horses were very important. Palomar was especially important. He had won blue ribbons at horse shows and fairs all over the country, so he was famous. People traveled hundreds of miles just to look at the great horse, and Palomar always treated the crowd to a good show with high stepping around and around his pasture field in true champion style. Everyone admired Palomar, but no one ever gave Scamp so much as a glance. No one but his friend Orvi. Scamp often dreamed that he was a famous Palomar, surrounded by an admiring crowd. Sometimes, when the dog was sure no one was watching, he would imitate the great horse, with high stepping around the barn, a lot with his nose up in the air. Then one day, Orvi caught him at it. Ho, <laughs> Scamp, he chored. What you up to? Who do you think you are, you silly old dog? Scamp had never felt so foolish in all his life. To be called a silly old dog was more than he could bear. And while Orvi was busy feeding the chickens, Scamp went slinking out of the barn a lot and down the road he was running away. Just when he was going he had where he was going he had no idea. But after trotting along for about a mile the dog found himself panting. It was a hot summer afternoon, much too hot to be trotting about with his shaggy fur coat and then he came to a dense woods and he stopped. Scamp had heard about this place. People believed that a wicked little witch lived there who possessed great magic power and if anyone dared to enter the woods she might turn him to stone or into a toad. So Scamp was in no mood to worry about a little witch. So he went 
in he went. He was much cooler in the dark spooky woods and ever so quiet. The only sound was a bubbling of a brook running along through the jumbled rocks. The brook finally trickled down to a crystal clear pool where Scamp stopped and stared at his gloomy reflection. This was the first time he had taken a look at himself and more than ever he wished he were a horse. All at once the hair on the back of his neck bristled. Someone was watching. Quickly Scamp wheeled around looking right and left and then finally up into a sycamore and there was the little witch leaning out the window of her tree house. Scamp was on his feet all ready to run when the witch said, So you want to be a horse, do you? And before you say scat, she flew out of the door and down the steps and was nose to nose with a bewildered dog. Why, old Zaley can turn you into a horse in a twinkling, she said, patting him gently on the head. Oh, but I can do much better than that, doggy. How would you like to be something fantastic? The only one of its kind in all the world. A marvelous, magnificent something I call a wing-ding-dilly. What do you say? Scamp crooked his head and thought for a few seconds. Then he wagged of his tail and barked, yes! Bark, good dog. So we'll get on with it, she cries, snapping a twig off the sycamore. I don't really need a wand. Any old thing will do. My magical power is all in the words. Just watch. What is she going to do? Suddenly, Zadley was dancing about like a grasshopper, weaving the twig in the air. And in her high, screechy voice, she resurrected the magic words. Diggly, daggly, ziggly, dee, zump. We'll start right off with a camel hump. <gasps> he has a camel hump. Then camel hind legs and kangaroo diddly do with zebra stripes and a zebra tail too. <gasps> Look at him! What has she done? Now for the neck curse snickery snaff and squish brown spots like a giraffe. Oh no! Oh, what has she turned him into? Kalump mobo jumbo ka jellyfant. Here's the big feet in front legs of an elephant. Oh my goodness. How many different animals is he? He's got elephant feet, zebra legs, a camel hump, a giraffe neck. Oh my goodness. She's not done yet. Zoom, zoom, zabaroo. Must everything go? So how about a rhinoceros nose, elephant ears, a flap flop, and reindeer horns, ziggy zop, out the top. I've got it, I've got, I've done it, Ziggly cried gleefully. There you are, dog, the one and only Zzzz, wing ding dilly. Take a look at yourself. Oh my goodness. Look what she turned him into. He has reindeer antlers, elephant ears, rhinoceros nose, 
a giraffe neck, a camel's back, an elephant front legs, and zebra back, and a zebra tail. <gasps> oh my goodness. And the sudden change had made him dizzy, and Scamp trotted unsteadily on his new set of legs as he turned around to face the pool. What he saw was much too much to take in all at once, and with a loud rhino snort, he went staggering backwards. <gasps> he saw himself for the first time. What do you think he thought? See what I mean, said the little witch. You're one whopping big surprise. Now I'd better skedaddle if I'm going to make cookies today. And Ziddly, Zeely, scurried up the steps into the treehouse, leaving the wing-ding dilly, wondering what he would do. Finally, he decided he'd better go home. Just as he started off, the witch called out the window, Take care! You don't step in a tulip bed with those big clumsy feet of yours! In the shadows of the sycamore were rows of bright yellow flowers, and as he headed back through the trees, he, caref he, was, he was careful to step around them. Making his way through the dense woods, he had been easy for the dog, but now it was almost impossible for the wing-ding dilly. It was a struggle even every step of the way, with his antlers catching on tree limbs the rhino's horn hooked into vines, and the clumsy elephant feet stumbled over logs, and the camel's feet tripping over the elephant's feet, and the going was so slow that it was near sundown when he finally made it to the edge of the woods. As Scamp poked his head out through the tree, he surprised a sow and her six piglets. Squealing in terror, they went racing pell-mell away through the weeds. What a fright I must be, thought Scamp. I'm in no shape to be running around in plain sight. No telling what people might do. Then search Stretching his long giraffe neck, he raised his head for a view of the countryside. As far as he could see, the fields were deserted, and so were the roads. All the farmers had gone to dinner, so there was a good chance of getting home without being seen. As he lumbered out into the open road, he found the going was easier. It was a matter of keeping the long stride camel legs from overrunning and pr prompting elephant le legs. He was clumping along at a pretty good clip when all at once he heard Orvi calling. Here, Scamp! Here, Scamp! Here, Scamp Boy! He was coming up the road, just over the next hill. If Orvi sh should come face to face with a wing-ding-dilly, especially in the eerie light of the evening, it might scare his scur scrawny little friend out of a year's growth. That wouldn't do. In one clumsy leap, Scamp was over the fence and went sprawling headlong into a wheat field. There he remained flat on to the ground, scarcely breathing, and as still as a wheat stalk. Does he look like a wheat stalk? Kind of, doesn't he? And when Orvi came to the top of the hill, he stopped. For one last call, such a long, loud, here, scamper, 
as it echoed for a mile across the countryside when he listened for the answering bark, but there was only a faraway crowing of a rooster. Where could he be? wondered Orvy as he turned and headed back down the road. Scamp raised his head to watch until the boy was no more than a speck in the distance. Then, with an effort, he hauled himself to his feet and hobbled over the fence back onto the road. By the time he was, by this time he was getting leg weary, and he went plowing along ever so slowly. It was growing dark when he finally reached the Jarvis farm. Cautiously, he pushed open the gate, tiptoed across the yard to the house, and peeked in the kitchen window. The family had just finished dinner, every one but Orvy, who sat at the table, staring at his plate. Scamp is always home at dinner time, said the little boy. Something's happened to him, or he'd be here. He just didn't know what had happened, did he? If old Scamp's really gone for good, said his father, then I'll tell you what. Armstrong's have a new colt, and if they'll sell him, he's all yours. How would you like that, son? It's not the same, said Orvy. You can't get to know a horse, not like you can a dog. Old Scamp understood just about everything I said. He was a lot smarter than any horse, and besides that, he was a real friend. Scamp could hardly believe his flappy ears, so Orvy didn't really mean it when he called him a silly old dog. In fact, Orvy thought he was smart. And Scampy heaved a great sigh of relief. <sighs> but what would Orvy think of a wing-ding-dilly? Scamp decided to wait until morning to find out. He stood there in the dark until he was sure everybody had gone to bed. When the wing-ding-dilly stretched out full length on the front porch with a monstrous yawn. <gasps> Maybe this is something, but nothing but a bad dream, he thought. And when I wake up, I'll be the same as ever. Pretty soon, he was sound asleep and snoring like a rhinoceros. The next day, Scamp knew it was morning and Orvy was shouting Dad! Mom! Come quick! There's something! A, a great big thing out here! The wing ding dilly struggled to its feet looking wildly about for a big thing then suddenly he remembered that he was the thing and went staggering backwards off the porch out into the yard and into one clumsy leap. He was over the fence and galloping away down the road. Ooh, he is something, isn't he? His head was in such a whirl he didn't see the man driving his cows to pasture until he was almost upon them. In a panic, the man jumped into the ditch and the bawling, terrified cows went crushing through the fence, scattering in all directions. Another man was so shocked at the sight of the gigantic beast, he lost control of his tractor and the machine went plowing through a haystack to the end up in the duck pond. Then there was a near head-on collision with a horse and buggy. A terrified horse left the road and in one leap to go scurrying up a telegraph pole, buggy and all. 
Now the wing-ding dilly didn't dare stop or even slow down as he kept going full gallop all the way back to the woods. Scamp was hot, hoping Zaylee would understand his awful predicament and undo her magic spell. Once again, he fought his way through the tangle of trees. Then he reached the tree house. He gave the door a resounding thump with his snout, then watched for Zaylee to pop her head out the window, but no Zaylee appeared. The shutters were latched and the door was locked and bolted. If she's gone, she'll be back sooner or later, so all I can do is wait. It would be a long wait. Early that morning, Zaylee had packed her suitcase, spruced herself up in her fancy best and left on a trip to visit her sister in Massachusetts. She didn't sail away on a broomstick like most witches. Do Zaylee was in no hurry, so she had taken the train. Now, she was riding along in a comfortable munching on sugar cookies with no thought whatever of what had happened to the wing-ding dilly. In the meantime, all the farmers in the neighborhood had formed a small army, and with guns and pitchforks, they followed the trail to a huge footprint straight into the woods, but they didn't dare go in, for now the woods would be more frightening than ever. We'll wait him out said Big Moose Mulford, the leader of the army. The minute the monster shows his face, Powie, we'll pop him off. The farmer stood watch into the evening, then all through the night, and then morning came. There was still no sign of the monster. From now on, the old moose will split up in bunches with some taking the night watch and others taking the day. But after watching the woods night and day for a week, the biggest thing to come out was a rabbit. By this time, news of the monster had spread all over the country, all the way to Central City, and finally to Claxton J. Pringle, the great showman. C.J. Pringle's Palace of Living Wonders. C.J. Pringle's Palace of Living Wonders towered majestically above the city square. Over the main entrance was a sign reading, Entry of the Marvelous and the Amazing, the most colossal collection in incredible creatures to have been seen anywhere on earth. The great showman had traveled all over the world in search of spectacular new attractions for his montage. And when he read in the newspaper that a fantastic giant of a beast was running loose in the country. C.J. was jubilant. Eureka! He cried. Why, if this beast is half what they say it is, would be worth a fortune. But first I must get my hands on the thing. Within a half an hour, C.J. was rounded up his roughest, toughest crew of roustabouts, and they took off into the Hooperson auto bus, followed by a ten-ton beast-moving van. The great showman was in desperate hurry, so he went at top speed all the way 
with a horn blaring full blast, warning every one to clear the roads. And in no time they came to a screeching stop alongside the woods where all the farmers rushed out to greet him. If you've come after the monster, Moose Mulford said, he's somewhere back in those trees, but you'd better be careful. He's a real whopper. The bigger the better, said CJ. Then turning to his men, he warned, Don't get too tough. I want the beast all in one piece. Easy goes. Easy does it, they promised him with a lasso chain, leg irons, the roustabouts went charging into the woods. By the time Scamp had discovered what all the crashing around in the bushes was all about, he was surrounded. He tried to run, but after one turn around the sycamore, the men closed in grabbing onto his legs, his neck, and his tail. In a fast and furious struggle, they wrestled him to the ground and roped and chained him from head to foot and then dragged him away through the woods. Thunder Nation! roared CJ at first sight of the great beast. He's a whopper. No wonder there was such a big halluva. Say now, he exclaimed, there's a good name for a thing. A havalubber. The super duper havalubber. Suits him, T, chuckled Moose Melford. Now that the danger had passed, the farmers were happy, but... They were laughing and joking while the beast was being loaded into the van, and C.J. Pringle and his crew headed back up the road towards the city, and the farmers gave them a rousting cheer. Hooray! That night, the bewildered, bedaggled, super-duper Havabaluber was hustled down a ramp into the basement of Pringle's palace and left in a cage with other living wonders of the world. There he remained while CJ was bustling about the city getting pal cards printed and posters printed to advertise his fabulous new attraction. The most colossal, most sinuous, most Panamathan creature in all the universe. Don't miss the grand presentation at C.J. Pringle's Palace of Living Wonders in the great day of July 12th. When the great day arrived, Pringle's Palace was jammed to overflowing with thousand more waiting in line outside. Keep calm, everybody, bellowed CJ in the noisy, excited crowd, kept pushing and shoving for a closer look at the amazing beast high up on the pedestal. The super-duper Havilbaluber was too much to believe. Some people poked at him with canes, others yanked on his tail, to make sure the beast was real. Now Scamp was even more famous than the great Palamore. And yet he never had been so miserable in all his life. He wished there was some way to escape, but he was always kept chained to the pedestal and after the show he was caged in the basement for the night. So it seemed that Scamp was doomed to spend the rest of his days as the greatest of all living wonders in Pringle's palace.
Then one afternoon, Zaylee returned home. Zerx! she cried. When she reached her treehouse, somebody tramped her tulips, and I know who. All around the sycamore were tell-tale elephant tracks and a camel's tracks with a wing-ding-dilly. I'll get even, she muttered, and don't worry, wing-ding-dilly, I'll find you. When Zeely shut her eyes to concentrate, now let me see, let me, mm, yeah, so there you are, living in a palace, a highfalutin somebody, the celebrity, are you? Well, I'll fix that. And in one hop, Zeely was up on a stump, then aiming her umbrella in the exact direction of Central City, the angry little witch exploded. Whammy! Kazemi! Zero floor! Ziggy zum zap! Zucka! Zucka poof! And in one great purple poof, the super duper Havabalupa was gone. In its place stood a plain, ordinary, frowsy brown dog. The crowd was flabbergasted that for all the full minute they were left gasping in amazement. Then all at once they burst into an uproar and shouted, It's a fake! It's a fake! The Havabalooba was a hoax! We've been Hordwinkle wobbled! We've been rooked! Claxton J. Pringle, you're a swindler and a crook! Uh-oh. And for the very first time, the great showman was caught speechless. In a huffing, puffing flurry, he seized the dog by the tail and scruff of the neck and hustled him off through the crowd. Out! 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 And the devil take you! He bellowed as he flung the dog out the front door. In one pounce, Scamp was on his feet, racing down the street, dodging in and out through traffic. Now that he was free, there was nothing more to worry about. Finding his way out of the city was easy to do. Dogs have a fine sense of direction. And by nightfall, Scamp was lopping along the dusty road, far out in the country. I'm a lucky to be a dog, he said to himself, with sense enough to find my way home. Even a great horse like Palomar might get lost in a big city. Scamp had not felt so happy and carefree in a long time. And when he came over the last hill and spied the Jarvis house, he barked joyfully. When he came, then he came bounding into the yard. Orvi leaped down off the porch shouting, Scamp! Scamp! It's old Scamper! Scamp's come home! In a wild, rough, and tumble greeting, the boy and the dog went sprawling in the grass. Scamp, you old rascal! Where have you been? Where have you been all this time? Roof, roof, replied Scamp, which was much as a dog could tell him. And of course, Orvi could never guess where Scamp had been. Not in a zillion years. The end. I hope you enjoyed the story. Come back and join us again.